Hello and welcome to this repair tutorial and today we're going to look at a TIAC and the model number is an A-R650 and this is the Mark II version of the amplifier. In terms of general specifications we're looking at a power output of 120 watts RMS times 2 and that's into a 4 ohm speaker load and this will be reduced down to 90 watts per channel into 8 ohms and the amplifier supports a dual speaker connection so you can select between A and B from the front fascia and uh, the impedance range there is up to 16 ohms and then for input sensitivity for the MD tuner, CD, AV, AUX and you also have a tape input as well that's at 180 millivolts and just for reference commonly they're referred to as your line inputs and then because you can connect a turntable then it supports a moving magnet type cartridge and that's at 2.8 millivolts with an input impedance of 47 kilo ohms and then frequency response for the amplifier comes in at 10 hertz to 65 kilohertz and distortion is less than 0.02 percent for an 8 ohm speaker loader a frequency of 1 kilohertz at 45 watts and you can connect external devices to it so the amplifier has a line output and that has an 150 millivolt maximum amplitude. You can also use the headphone socket for personal listening that accepts a quarter inch jack and then on the right hand side you'll see that you also have a microphone input and there is also a variable level adjustment also. You can select direct mode if you want to die bypass the tone control circuits and a handy feature also is the mute control and then dimensions wise height is 142 uh, width of 435 and it has a depth of 355 millimeters and an overall weight of 2.9 kilograms. The amplifier is also fully um, sort of controllable via an external remote so it comes with a UR series remote control unit and you can change of course input selection you can place the amplifier into standby mode as well as um, controlling for example the volume control. Now for this amplifier what did it come in with the workshop? Well it had multiple faults. The first one is a very very common one so if you turn on the amplifier from the front fascia it has a conventional latching type switch and that will provide power then to the startup board which is of course at the back of the amplifier and this will provide the necessary voltage to the microprocessor and the microprocessor is a surface mount device on the front control or front tone board and the microprocessor will also be checking of course for the input voltages from the secondary of the transformer to make sure that there is no excessive DC on the output terminals. If you press the standby button which is directly above the power button normally after about five seconds you should hear a click come from the startup relay and it should be permanently energized. What you found on this amplifier was after maybe about six seconds you just heard a click and that meant that the relay was disengaged and of course there would be no power lights on the front fascia except for the power LED which would be flashing red to indicate an issue. Now what I show in the in the video is the startup transformer and what you'll also see is there is a secondary connector which connects to the power supply board from the from the large power transformer very very easy if you just disconnect that and then you then again try and initiate the amplifier via the standby button what you'll find is that the standby or the startup relay will energize and it will stay energized so that's meaning that the protection circuit of course is not picking anything up from the main amp board because you've disconnected the power by unplugging the the sort of three core multi-pin connector from the transformer now it's not common but you can get failures of this EI power transformer. If you do, then you can test it in two ways. You can, of course, disconnect any power to it and unplug the primary and do a continuity measurement. But just to be aware that when you do that, this transformer does have quite a low resistance on the primary. So you could be kind of misled, thinking maybe there was a short circuit. The, the Probably the best way to do it is just to use the secondary one. And then once the amplifier you know, powers up, and the power is provided to the power transformer you can just measure the secondary AC voltages. Now the way in which you sort of undertake fault finding on this amplifier because of its modular construction you can just strip it down to the main circuit board 
So here you remove the back panel and you'll find multiple screws left and right and then also underneath the amplifier and then the typical screws which hold in place the speaker terminals and then also the RCA sockets and you'll find two um, panhead Phillips screws which secure in place also the startup board. Just be aware that this is a common ground type connection amplifier so the back panel must be installed and also the necessary screws installed which will complete the ground circuit. You really do not even want to think about powering up the amplifier for test purposes if the back panel has been removed because it will cause substantial damage to the amp. And then once you have removed the main board, and this is what I'm showing, also be aware that you need to check the board also for dry solder joints. The reason being is that sometimes during failure, and it may also be the reason for failure of, of the amp board, you can find joy, dry joints are appearing. Now on the version 1 or the Mark 1 version, it uses, or it used 64E tin lead solder. On the Mark 2, it is lead free. So the board or the solder connections have a different colour to them, but just be aware that it's not you know, conventional lead solder on the later version. I would say generally for electronics, the older type solder, you know, it's not lead free. It's probably easier to diagnose dry joints. Sometimes from experience, I've even seen, you know, the ones which use the lead free solder. You think electrically it looks connected, but when you then reflow, often it can cure, you know, sort of intermittent faults. Because at a chemical level, you know, the solder did not appear to bond to the component lead. Now, when these amplifiers fail, the most common issue is the failure of the left or the right channels. And the reason for that for failure could be multiple. It may be accidentally that the user of the amplifier inadvertently maybe shorted one of the speaker wires at the back to the back plate and it went to ground. Or it could be a dry joint or it may just be you know, an aging effect and the output stage fails. For this amp, only one of the channels failed. And the one that I'm showing you here now is the left channel. And then this is the left channel circuit diagram and remember you can apply this to both the 630 series amplifier and it could be a mark 1 or a mark 2 it doesn't matter the service manual is available and it's a good service manual overall uh, but you will find that um, there are a number of components to change so the output transistors for the 630 series are not the same as the 650 because it requires higher current and there's also some uh, small um, capacitors that you need to change um, Oh, sorry, not you need to change. There are filter capacitors, high frequency ones, which are different between the 630 and the 650, but the service manual tells you that. So when these output transistors fail, what you'll find is excess current will flow through the emitter resistors and they will also go open circuit. You have no indication that that is the case until you remove them and then you make a resistance measurement. Very, very easy to obtain, 0.222 ohm ceramic type, and they are rated at 5 watts. Once you've replaced the sank and output transistors, and point to note, always purchase from a um, reputable component supplier and make sure that what you are purchased is indeed an original part and not one of these counterfeit um, devices which can be you know, sourced from any online website and normally coming from uh, you know, Asia. Um, yeah, don't go down that route, you know, just make sure that the components that you're purchasing are, are going to be the, the correct ones. If you put them in and they're not the originals, you know, the output channel will fail and it will undo a lot of the good work that you've already done and it'll probably wind up, you know, that you'll be needing to replace not just the output transistors, but also, you know, multiple resistors that also fail. And then the other thing that gives you indication, I'll sort of show you this again now, you can see that there are bias resistors for the driver stage and here it's R3 R, or R532 and R533 and these are rated at 100 ohms and they're quarter watt type and they burn out and you can visually have an indication of this and then the other two resistors and again I'm showing you now are R535 and R536 now it's a telltale sign that the output stage has failed normally you'll find discoloration on these resistors and when you remove them they'll be way out so instead of them being 680 or 470 often you'll find you know they're in the order of killer ohms so over a period of time it seems that the resistors sort of drift out of spec and then heat up and this is what we saw on this amplifier there was also dry joints around the uh, 
the power devices. But when you're doing that dry joint sort of inspection, don't just concentrate on the part of the amplifier that is failed. You know, just check the whole board because it's quite common that you might see sort of cracks around some of the component leads. So just reflow and make sure, you know, you don't have any issues with, uh, with that part. And then in terms of setting up the bias, and again, what I'm showing here is you need to make up a test connector lead because on the left hand channel you can't just get your multimeter leads in there because the startup board sits above it. So what they do is they just provide these apertures where one you can get access to the bias trimmer and then the other one is where you can plug in a small little test connector then connect the other leads, end of the leads to your multimeter and then what you're looking to do here is to have no speakers connected, no input signals and you're looking to set your volume control to minimum and your balance treble and bass to midpoint and then leave the amplifier running for about 15 to 20 minutes and then adjust the bias until you read approximately six uh, sorry five millivolts and that's what i'm showing just a word of caution as well you know when, when you're doing this uh, bias adjustment remember that you should really power it up via a bim, dim bulb tester and i've put the link in the video description the reason for that is if you had another underlying issue and maybe you hadn't found all of the defective parts, you don't want to want to power it up, you know, without the dim bulb because it could cause catastrophic, you know, failure. Just a, a note here is if the amplifier, of course, has been switched off because you've been working on it and servicing it, when you first connect it, it needs to charge up the large power supply capacitors. So what you'll find is the dim bulb brights lightly. But if you keep hitting the standby button two or three times, they will eventually charge and then the dim bulb will return back you know, to, to a low level. If you see that the dim bulb lights every single time very, very bright, then that means you still have another issue with the amplifier. Uh, so you need to go and have a look what's going on in the main board. And what I would also say as well is just because in this case the left channel failed, I also make the necessary checks on the open transistors to verify that the right has also not failed as well because that can sometimes happen and the bias resistors you know haven't burnt out so it doesn't really give you any sort of form of indication so once that was done with this amplifier you know you're kind of in that test phase then and uh, what i noticed was uh, just a number of issues there was actually two other issues the first one is the um, power power button so when you pressed it on and off it would kind of sort of stick a bit and it didn't always disengage and then what I show is the rear and what you have is this metal mounting plate and um, for some reason there's a small little tab at the side which just um, sort of it doesn't slot into anything but it just sort of keeps the squareness of that plate don't ask me why but that was bent so instead of the plant plate being you know sort of um, horizontal to the switch it was just offset so when the switch was being pressed in it was just catching onto the metal fascia so easy enough to do just to remove that metal plate and then I'm just using some pliers then just to adjust it back into place and then refit the power switch and once that was done you could press it you know 10 20 times and every time it would disengage and then relatch again so that was all good and all perfect and then when I was doing the initial test it's a bit of a strange one but I've seen this on these amplifiers so many times what you'll find is you may get, for example, either the left channel or the right channel, you don't get any kind of audio. And you think, well, I've just repaired the channel, so have I got an issue there? And if you use like a signal tracer, you'll find that the signal is entering the amplifier preamp board or the volume control board that is shown. And um, it's not like a loss of signal, which is coming in from the input stage or the input selection IC. You now that is all fine. The issue is actually over time and i think in some cases it depends if these amplifiers have been stored maybe in a slightly damp environment that the multi-pin connectors which just slot in from the volume control board into the tone board just become oxidized and literally if you just move the board slightly with your hands you'll get the audio then just to come back very very clear and then you kind of move it again and then it will disappear so what i do is i will just simply remove the volume control knob remove the two fixing screws and then you can then just disconnect the flying lead which is the audio signal lead from the main amp board and then unplug the uh, board from the tone control board and then what I do is I'll just spray into all of those different sockets just some deoxid and then what I'll do is I'll just take my fiberglass pencil and I'll just literally just wipe 
the pins of the multi-pin terminal and then I'll just pop it into the socket and then I'll just put it in and out probably 10 or 15 times just to make sure that any oxidization has then been cleared and then reinstall it and then once you test it then there's no intermittent loss of sound at all and you literally you can move that board you can flex it you can do anything you want and the audio will not drop out and I've seen this not only on the 650 series but also on the 630 but this isn't unique to TIAC you know many com companies have used these types of connectors myself probably not the best I don't I don't feel you know for something like that I tend to say you, you really want more of a solder type connection or at least maybe a connector which latches in rather than just requires you know multi pins just to push in but that's what manufacturers kind of decide to do then and then um, in terms of final test you know no other issues sort of flagged up on the amplifier and uh, you know from a from an operational point of view I would say that these TX deliver you know a good good sound quality uh, and build quality is reasonably good you know uh, the mark II version I think uh, was probably available from about 2014 but it's only in sort of recent times that it's now been discontinued and it's been replaced by other units but Spares available, you know, even if it's sank and output transistors and are obsolete or end of line, service manuals available uh, as well. And then if you want to buy any sort of parts, then for the UK, Sontech Electronics is the main supplier. So if you needed, you know, so maybe a transformer or anything else, or even a circuit board, if you went to that level, then Sontech would be the company that you would uh, reach out to and then contact. So as I'm showing here, I just really just sort of have... A series of uh, photographs which, where I've indicated where components have failed and sort of drawn a line around them. And then the same also for these 1 watt uh, resistors which also fail with the discoloration. So it's just more uh, insight for yourself so you can see exactly what's going on. And if you are undertaking any repairs of these amplifiers, and again I've used this term many, many times, you just really just take a systematic approach. Just take a logical step order, work your way through it. Uh, just verify your work, you know, don't feel rushed or maybe, uh, you know, time's not on your side. Just just be methodical, check any solder joints, make sure you've got, not got any bridges or anything. And if you follow this repair description, in most cases you should come out to the point that you have a fully working amplifier and, uh, you know, many years of sort of good listening. Or if you're repairing it on behalf of someone else, a happy customer. So there you have it. So not a long repair tutorial, but, you know, good information that you can use to repair your own amplifier. And uh, I really do appreciate you stopping by. And if you need any help, support or guidance, by all, by all means, email audio amplifier servicing at AOL.com. And I'll be more than happy to come back to you and provide any assistance or guidance that you may require. So until the next time, cheers. Bye bye.